All right, welcome everyone to our webinar today. We're excited to talk to you about continuous change management in a secure way uh, for today's topic. We'll give folks just another minute to join in before getting started. <clears throat> While we wait, I wanted to share some housekeeping items with you. Uh, we are recording today's webinar and I will share both the recording and the deck with all of you within the next few days after our pre presentation today. I'm also joined by some of my customer success colleagues We'll be able to answer some of your questions along the way through the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, you may submit them via the Zoom Q&A. So uh, we'll be able to kind of take a look at those and help answer those along the way. And uh, just a brief introduction of myself. My name is Chris Guitarte. I'm a senior customer success engineer here at GitLab. And I'd like to introduce you to some of the folks here that will be talking to you today uh, on today's topic. Uh, first, we've got Wayne Haber. He's a director of engineering here at GitLab, focusing on growth, security, governance, machine learning, and anti-abuse. Uh, we've also got uh, Sandra Breenan, who's a customer success manager here at GitLab. Uh, and I'll, you know, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Sandra to kick things off. So um, thanks, Chris. So every company uh, must be great at developing, securing, and developing software while also cutting costs. You know, this is really important to every company and every organization. Change enablement is about, according to ITIL, you know, maximizing the number of successful service and product changes by ensuring that risks have been assessed, authorizing changes to proceed, and managing the change schedule. Anything to add to this, Sandra? Yeah, so this is also related again to to uh, change management in, uh, in in general, where change management uh, has been uh, around for a long, a long time and uh, people uh, organizations are constantly trying to to evolve in that and ITIL is the organization that sort of formalized that and uh, helped organizations to to uh, professionalize it and in their latest edition the fourth edition they even um, added a way to to provide organizations with this continuous change management function uh, they mentioned that uh, organizations might add automation to that change management process in order to provide this continuous change management. So characteristics of the challenge, you know, manual approval processes. You know, every time something's a manual approval process, you're waiting on people and it can be very subjective on approving or not. And often people default to no because they may not fully understand thing or it's easy for them to say no because they don't have the full context of the needs for a change. External security approval, also separate security approval, not only manual, but sometimes external security where they're not integrated into the process. Uh, fixed deploy slots, where you're only doing deploys at certain times of day, certain days of the week. I've definitely lived all of these things, not, not at GitLab, at previous companies I was at, where we would have fixed deploy slots. And it was very stressful on everyone and lowered the, uh, the velocity uh, uh, to which you could make changes. Um, anything to add to this, Sander? Uh, yeah, it, it, I think many of these things have been uh, might have been introduced while adopting ITIL uh, to mitigate risks of ch uh, making changes to mitigate um, any problems and, and make sure that the change will happen uh, correctly and without without uh, stability problems, so to say. Uh, so that yeah, that's where this is coming from in the past. Next slide. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of shifts in software de delivery, you know, many, many years ago, most organizations were doing waterfall, then they worked on unifying processes, moved to agile, moved to DevOps, and then now adopting DevSecOps so that you can only develop quickly, deploy quickly, get features and uh, bugs fixed quickly, but also maintain, monitor those changes for a performance and availability and error rates and user acceptance, and also uh, security in terms of the SEC part of DevSecOps to find and fix, find, prioritize and fix the security issues as early as possible and as close as possible to the one they're introduced so that you can reduce your security risk, but also reduce the time to fix those issues. Uh, because the later they're fixed, the more likely they might get exploited. But also the later they're fixed, whether it's a security issue or a quality issue, the more expensive they are to fix. Exactly. Yeah. And this is all, again, uh, following markets, changes, 
uh, with the coming of e-commerce, with a lot of internet um, people being on the internet, uh, making sure that that your customers are able to go to your store to buy something. So the whole market is is evolving, it's changing very rapidly and organizations have to adapt to that. So this whole shift in software delivery is to keep up with that. Yeah, next, yeah. So GitLab, we have a single DevSecOps platform to support continuous change management in a secure way. Um, so you can make changes continuously and with uh, high confidence that they're going to work and ability to roll them back and monitor, monitor them and roll them back if need to, and also monitor and keep track of security issues and resolve them as quickly as possible. So continuous delivery is about the overall software delivery value stream. Planning and creating, so planning the changes, issues in epics, for example, um, integrating and verifying, so doing um, automated tests, having automated verification of those tests, doing both unit tests and integration tests, deploying those changes, so automated deployment. So that's the continuous deployment part. Uh, integrate is more the continuous integration part. So deploying those changes once the tests succeed and they're moved out to multiple environments and then operating them uh, to making sure that they're, um, they're working properly. And then also monitoring and improving them, looking at error rates, uh, operating them in terms of uh, feature flag management on new changes, and overall doing continuous improvement so you can continue to improve the overall service and product that you're responsible for. Overall, it streamlines collaboration and eliminates context switching. Collaboration and context switching are both really key. You know, collaboration is making sure everybody's working together and that the systems support the people, not the people being subjected to the systems um, and being able to work together success successfully. And context switching is really important is people can focus on their part get their part done and then turn it over to the system to do the next parts, which may involve other people acting or may not. That uh, flow is really important to everyone's uh, morale, but also effectiveness in terms of being able to um, get things done and having continuous delivery and continuous improvement to supporting continuous change management allows for both of those things or helps to support significantly both of those things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I don't have much to add. It's just, this is a great story. And uh, yeah, it, it comes with a lot of benefits, which you see in the next slide. There's some of the benefits. Time to market, reducing the time to market on changes that you want to uh, get out there to benefit your customers. Improved quality. So those changes will be of higher quality because you can automate it test them in an automated way, validate them, monitor if the testing doesn't catch them. Um, and also these two things go play into each other. If developers are have fear of making changes, creating quality issues, they slow down the rate of change on features and bug fixes. So improving the quality and automating as much of that as possible and making it so that they can like turn things off with a feature flag. If there is a quality issue, allows you to improve your time to market because people have more confidence that their changes won't create an issue. Or if they do, that they will um, be able to respond to it quickly and with low risk to the users. Reduce costs. Overall, this reduced costs to uh, overall on the uh, what it takes to deliver these changes. And also, as we mentioned before, better collaboration. It gives, it enables each person working their part of the process, the ability to do their part and really be a manager of one, perhaps. So they can do their part and be really successful and collaborate with others as enhanced by and assisted by the systems, not hindered by the systems and processes in place. True, yeah. Yeah, so time to market is again, following these shifts that we've seen earlier. And um, yeah, the, web, the market is rapidly changing and organizations have to adapt. Uh, so with Agile, we saw that uh, people or organizations were much better at changing requirements so that it's not like in waterfall a, a lot of things happen and then you implement a lot of things are written down then you implement them and half a year later or a year later you have a product so with agile that changed and now you see that uh, we're not just focusing on the requirements part we are really focusing on the software production part bringing lean into the software production so that the software factory part and that brings us these benefits um, and bringing in lean or DevSecOps will 
help you finding things like vulnerabilities or quote quality issues very early on. And it has been investigated that if you if you can solve these issues as early as possible, then the cost of fixing those is way lower and maybe like only 10% than when you can you have to do that when the product is almost ready. So therefore you reduce a lot of cost in, in shifting left on security. Overall, it improves organizational performance, yes. uh, which is really key. Yeah, organizational performance is based on uh, the, the yeah, go into the next slide. It's good. I'll, I'll take that one as well. Uh, so it's a research from uh, the DevOps Research and Assessment uh, Organization uh, who in investigated based on the uh, state of DevOps report what organizational performance is impacted by. And they found that the organizational performance is, among other things, impacted by software delivery performance, which is in the, in effect impacted or predicted by continuous delivery or continuous change management, if you want. Um, and if you want to improve your continuous change management, then there are some technical practices that you uh, can implement in order to uh, make that better. You can click once again, then we'll see that uh, organization performance is not only predicted by software delivery performance, but also by a, a culture and work environment a lightweight change approval process and lean product development. Uh, and even more so, and maybe even more important is that implementing these technical practices leads to, or predicts at least, uh, less burnout for your, for your employees, but also less rework and less deployment pain. So doing this helps make your developers more happy, but it also helps in your organizational performance, which is, paramount or almost mandatory in, in a current market space to keep up with the, the effort changing uh, organizations. Um, and then one last note on this approval process. So they also found that having a external rigid change approval process has no correlation to uh, the risk of failure. So the risk of failure, which is why this happy approval process was introduced in the first place, is not changing due to having a heavyweight approval process. And uh, it negatively correlates with lead time and deployment frequency. So your ability to make changes will go down if you have a heavyweight approval process. Uh, therefore, lightweight change approval process predicts a better software delivery performance. And this is, I think, the most important for this slide. And if you think about this in terms of you know, as an engineering director, as I've been, as I am at GitLab and have been at, at a number of companies, it's, what are, what are the pressures on me? Get more done, you know, get more features released that benefit the users, get more bugs fixed that users are impacted by, um, improve quality, you know, um, at, uh, whenever there are issues, get them fixed, you know, prioritize them fixed quickly that especially based on the amount of impact there but also don't overwork the team make sure the team has high morale make sure the team uh is uh has the ability to learn new things has the, the time and space to learn and make sure the team is enabled the team members the employees are enabled to do their job uh and not where the systems both the the systems and the processes that that we use support them rather than hinder them so those are not necessarily goals that those goals can't exist in a vacuum they all interplay with each other so using a process like this and uh, continual change management really helps with that making changes should be easy simple safe and secure so they, sh they should follow processes largely automated they should be simple prefer a boring solution over a complex one um this sounds kind of like a negative statement, it really isn't. A boring solution doesn't mean it's, um, boring is not bad, boring is good. It means it's easy to understand. It means it's easy to implement. It means it's easy to put an MVC, a minimal viable change out there and then iterate on it. Complex ones are sometimes needed, not, not very often, but sometimes needed. But the more you can do it, a simple boring solution and iterate on it, the more you can iter you can put it out there, get feedback on it from both the users, from the engineers, from the uh, error budgets, from performance measurement, 
and then iterate on it and then iterate it on again because complex solutions take a lot longer and they're using a crystal ball on what may be coming and that crystal ball may be perfect but often isn't so doing a more boring solution and iterating on it to improve it as you learn is really key in my opinion being safe so knowledge that if you make a mistake it'll be detected early so you can shift security to the left as far as possible um example is tell the developer when they introduce a security issue that they have display it to them as soon as you see it so that that developer can fix it uh can can validate and fix it not wait until the end when uh it's much harder to fix and harder to detect and you know also continuously check for vulnerabilities not only due to changes that the developers uh, introduce where they're never of course trying to introduce security issues it just sometimes they do that inadvertently but sometimes security issues are uh outside the control of the developers it might be that there's a, a dependent library that the code is using that the uh, there's a new security vulnerability released for it that your components are using the developers didn't introduce that it's that there's an outside change that you need to take advantage of so continuously checking for those vulnerabilities is really key whether you're updating the system or not there's security work to keep an eye on and act on yeah that one thing I would like to add to this is that with, with continuous change management, uh, it's my vision maybe to um, to prevent vulnerabilities rather than manage them. So if you can put security scans as early as possible in your process, you will find vulnerabilities uh, as early as possible in your process. You will find them before the merge request even merged into main. So with that, you, you can... Um, immediately solve these vulnerability findings before they have even uh, reached it into the main um, source line source branch uh, so i'd rather like to see organizations and teams prevent vulnerabilities uh, rather than manage vulnerabilities and um, uh, i think with continuous change management and and a shift left of security that can happen um, on the other hand there's a lot of projects and teams that have an existing repository and they are now going to shift left on security. So what do you do then? So in my opinion, uh, all these vulnerabilities that you will find in the first scan, they were there already. And of course you have to manage them. You have to look at them, but that doesn't have to happen uh, in the first week of uh, doing that scan. So my advice would be to still implement these scans as early as possible and then configure, configure them in a way that you only uh, show new findings in your merge request and make sure that you prevent any new findings on top of what you already have on your, uh, in your merge request. And in the meantime, you can then work separately as part of your, your release schedule or your sprint cadence on fixing any vulnerabilities that have high priority on the list of vulnerabilities. So GitLab's continuous change management process is we use uh, and are in the product. So we use our own product to develop our own product and the we call that dog fooding, but it also um, uh, helps us really understand the user's experience since we use it to build our own product. Use merge trains to build upon previous merge request state. So merge trains that, that depend on each other so that um, you can put out changes as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible. Trunk-based development without sh with short-living branches. If you have many branches of your code and you try to merge later, it can be a nightmare. I have lived through that at previous companies many times. Um, I always regret it. Uh, when it's long-lived branches, to um, nobody loves um, merge conflicts, and uh, this is a way to avoid it. Um, using minimal a minimal viable change MVC model to make continuous changes possible. So doing those smaller changes and then rolling them out and seeing how they work. Uh, you know, at GitLab and we recommend you know others consider it if not doing as well as using feature flags is really important. So for example, we may roll out on my teams um, and other my peers' teams um, a backend change before the front end change that uses it. So it might be you know the GraphQL API has a new field or a new function. Uh, new data available. We may release that first before the back before the front end is available. And then the front end comes later. Or maybe we release the front end first and we just mark it as this is disabled. 
but it allows us to start getting feedback. Once the backend API is there, people can start writing tests against it um, and start using it. Once the front end is there, we can get start getting feedback from users. And then iterating on these things as we go is um, really helps to make uh, continuous change possible. Uh, Error budgets and monitoring the number of errors when a threshold is above a value. So we, we do a lot of error budget monitoring at GitLab, the percentage of requests that are failing, um, and also uh, percentage of requests that are they, where the um, the 95th, I think we look, 95th percentile response time is higher than a certain number. We look at these where we in an automated way. Uh, we, we graph these things and our infrastructure team monitors them if they go above a threshold and we respond in real time um, to investigate. And they will then escalate to the development teams if they need help, which sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, to resolve. We also look at the low and slow issues in this where it's not doesn't rise above the threshold to escalate, but it's still a problem where teams look at these uh, weekly. Um, if there's not an escalation, we still look at the trend over time to see if something's degrading over time. And uh, for example, each of my teams, um, and my team is currently about 70 people, if I remember correctly, a uh, number of different groups, they weekly report an issue. Here's where I am at on my error budget uh, for the last week and the last 28 days. And here's, uh, we're over or above budget. And if we're um, over the budget, you know, not, not achieving the budget, here are the issues that are out there that we're looking into. Here's the here's the here's the status of them, et cetera. And um, that really helps to keep an eye on these things and not let them get away from you. Feature flags to quickly enable or disable features is key. And not just enable or disable, but also do a phased rollout um, so that you can try it for a percentage of users or customers first before all, um, and then roll back as needed. A B testing to test different approaches is really key. So you know you don't nobody has a perfect crystal ball. You don't necessarily know. What's going to work best? So you'll do different options on things to see how things work uh, and overall improve things. So, um, and an example of that right now on one of my teams is we're working on the uh, AI code suggestions feature at GitLab, which is currently beta, and we've tried different models for making code suggestions, and then we look at the uh, user acceptance rate of those suggestions to see which models are working better under what circumstances so we can give users the best experience. And also, as I mentioned, using incremental rollout to reduce risk. Um, rolling out not only to a percentage of customers or users in production, but also rolling out uh, to different environments. So we have our development environments, we have uh, our uh, staging environment, we also do canarying, so we, we send a percentage of production traffic to uh, servers to see how they're going before we fully roll the production. And we do many releases of GitLab to our .com customers, our, our hosted customers, every day. And do we do we never have issues? No, we we sometimes do have issues. That's why we have feature flags. That's why we have the ability to roll back, and that's why we monitor these things closely. And we've gotten really good at it. And the development team has high confidence; they can make changes with low risk of being big negative impact to customers. So we can, we can, um, they can, we, that way we get a high rate of change on new features being released while also keeping uh, quality and security and performance in mind as well so that we can balance those things. Awesome, yeah. They, you see a lot of the, the, the DOA technical practices in play here. So training-based development is one, but also monitoring is one, automation is one. Um, I presume you also have test automation in place to make sure that tests run automated and that new test data and test cases are checked uh, in the merge request. Yeah, so yeah, this, these are all these technical practices that I mentioned earlier uh, that predict um, software delivery performance. Thanks. DevSecOps best practices. So work on change management rather than a change management team. Work on change management process than a change management team. At previous companies, you know, in the distant past, I managed a, I led a change management team and it is a thankless job. Uh, it is very, it is very hard to succeed. And um, even though they did succeed, it was with, much heroics. So if you have a process, both technology and people process for the people to follow that supports the teams rather than 
controls the teams or manages the teams, it, it, it supports them and facilitates them. You end up with a much better, much better morale on the on uh, for all the team members, and also but just a more effective way to roll out changes quickly and effectively. So you want a lightweight automated change approval process. So we don't have zero manual change approvals at GitLab. We we have some, even though you know uh, it's it's we have very specific way or reasoning for when we require manual approval versus not. So for example, if you were launching a net new service, we want to make sure since that introduces a lot of risk for both scalability and security, we loop in the infrastructure team to look at scalability and security team to look at security. But we don't launch net new things that often We, uh, in the grand scheme of things because we do things at an MVC level to build on start small and build on it, but still sometimes we do launch something net new. So for example, code suggestions that I mentioned earlier that my team uh, are responsible for, that was net new. And we did infrastructure review and, and security review of those, but that's, it's pretty rare when we need to do that, but when we need to do it, it's really important. Um, it's, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time we have no manual approval process for changes. It's that handful of exceptions. Um, shifting left on security, building the right change into your change management process so that you can find those issues as early as possible and put it into the hands of the people who can resolve them, uh, who have the knowledge and the access to resolve them as early as possible in the process. And also, you know, as we mentioned before, building, I like this term, building safety harnesses, making so that developers and others working on changes can move quickly and effectively and be a you know a manager of one to push out changes, but have safety in there so that if something doesn't go well, it has minimal impact and can be fixed quickly. So they have that confidence to move quickly in their uh, in their new, you know, their changes to the software to make it enhance it and fix bugs in it to better serve the customers. Yeah. Uh, so th this again. Uh allows for making changes easy, simple, safe, and secure, as we mentioned earlier. Um, this is also what, what the DevOps Handbook will tell you. Um, well, simply making sure that your whole product or software delivery process is automated and optimized to provide flow of work, autom um, not only automated, but continuously and that uh, you can you are able to make changes to improve to experiment um, with the safety harness in place so that you can try things out without breaking the entire product without um, breaking stability so to say which is for the ops side of things uh, their most important thing it reminds me a bit of the meme i've seen many times uh, you know, when I test my code, I test in production um, uh, with, uh, I forget, I forget the actor they, they tend to put on that. Um, but the, if, if you have the right safety harness, you can test prior to production and in production uh, with low risk, but so you can move quickly. Exactly. So accelerating into DevOps um, and how to implement this, I've implemented uh, DevOps at previous companies I was at years ago, it does take a lot of change and change management in terms of people, leadership, and bring the people along for the process. In terms of um, the acronym uh, COMS, culture, automate, lean, measure, and share. So it is about um, making sure you have the support for, for accelerating DevOps, automating as much as possible, bringing people in the early adopters in early, knowing that not everybody's going to be an early adopter, uh, getting wins with those early adoption teams, and then bringing the, the middle of the bell curve folks, which is, you know, the 60%, say 20% early adopters along with them based on the successes. And then knowing that the late adopters might go kicking and screaming, but they'll, they'll need some help with that. Um, measuring how things work and just sharing the overall experiences. Um, Another key thing is to have the, you know, the executive support saying, you know, we need to move faster. We, we want to automate more. Um, so you can have that, not only the, the strategic to achieve, but also the vision communicated as well. What else would you add to this, Sandra? Yeah, uh, you see sources below. So th th these lists, uh, you, you see Wayne speaking on, okay, how important are these? 
Jess Humboldt defined this columns framework back in 2010, uh, also as part of the DevOps handbook. But later on in 2018, uh, Nicole Forsgren, she researched this and she even uh, found in, and, and described in an Accelerate book that all these things in the columns framework actually do predict uh, your performance. So uh, a gener generative organizational culture, uh, technical practices, lean product management, they all add and predict this uh, DevOps performance. Uh, so therefore I think this is, this is very valuable. How to transition, I covered this a little bit earlier, I got a little ahead of myself. How to transition from a change management team to a change management process is establish the vision, make a change management plan, identify the stakeholders. That's really key. So, you know, not only is it the development teams it's it, and the product management teams, it's security, it's infrastructure, uh, it may be legal, it may be, uh, uh, you know, other teams as marketing, maybe other teams as well. So communicate effectively, find your champions and advocates and early adopters, as I mentioned. That's really key to get some early wins and then build upon those, not do a, uh, a full switch for everybody all at once. Um, so start small. And key in engineering, engineers, they often forget to celebrate successes. It's really important to celebrate successes, whether it's in change management, um, uh, overhauling your change management process to be more um, to be more automated and enable people or other things. So really key to make sure to celebrate successes and also monitor and evaluate. So monitor how things are going, evaluate how they went, look at the quality of the releases as they're more automated. Um, in terms of bug rates, in terms of uh, performance, in terms of error rates, and also in terms of uh, how often, you know, the time to merge a change, the time to deploy a change. You'll see some marked changes as you do more automation in these areas, and it can really help to show the value and convince others it's the right thing to do, especially the middle of the road folks in the in the bell curve and even the uh, win over some of the some of the late adopters as well. So so when you mentioned that you you've done these these transitions before, um, would you what would you say in this list is is most prominent and most important to to have uh, to be successful in in making this transition? Yeah, I'd say like, so many 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 years ago, I was responsible at a previous company for deploying software that was a software as a service and. I think it was 400 developers work would go into this roughly. And it would, we'd schedule to do it from 9 p.m. to 3 p.m., three days in a row, two subsequent weeks, and we'd update it quarterly. Okay. That is hard on the people. It's not updating. We, we would still do dot releases occasionally when, you know, when they were critical, but we wouldn't, wouldn't put out new features except for every, every quarter, big new features. And that was, and we knew we need. We knew there was a better way, um, and we didn't try to do everything all at once. Um, we set error budgets. For example, we chose teams. Okay, which teams want to do this, and do we need to have do this earlier in order to get a higher rate of change? And we decided, for example, the uh, the web portal was one one of the key components. It was a lot of back end work too. For the set of systems, let's do the web app first because that's what users see and not the whole thing because there are many teams working on the web app. Let's choose the team or two that have the, the things where we want most of the features for most of the customers earlier and that where they're also interested in being an early adopter and started with those. And we didn't get everybody on the team bought in. We got a subset of the team and we started small and then built on that. We set error budgets. Like some people said, oh my gosh, we can't do this. The system's going to blow up when we update it if we're doing it so often, really often, and our customers are going to be upset. We said, okay, it's okay for some failures to occur. The error budget is not 0%. It's something higher than zero. We're willing to take some risk of some transactions and some requests failing in order to be able to move faster and kind of started there and built on it. Um, also knowing that, and then other teams came along over time and we, but some teams, they, some people on some teams, it wasn't some teams generally, we were just dead set against it. And it was somewhat due to um, fear of change. And also, you know, don't break, don't fix what's not broken was kind of their perspective in some cases when they weren't getting that it was broken. You know, releasing every three months was 
a non-starter uh, and we really needed to fix it. So some went along kicking and screaming at the end, but we, we, we showed them how it worked. And at the end, I think when we transitioned all the teams, we were able to do releases. I think we got to releases every day to every two days from quarterly via, via doing things like this. Occasionally, there was still some grousing where you know, we blew something up with a release and the you know, error rates went up, but we rolled it back quickly. And um, overall, the customers were much happier and we brought the quotes from customers on that they were getting features earlier. We looked at the error rates at the end, like they're not actually worse than they were before. They're actually better um, because we can respond quicker to bugs. So it's, it. but start small and build on it, communicate well, and know that not everybody's going to buy in at the beginning, but you win them along, you win them over to it along the way. Yeah, and, and on, on top of that, that um, we've seen many organizations trying to, uh, uh, in the process of making the transition to uh, continuous trace management or to uh, DevOps. But we also see in the latest DevOps report that a lot of organizations sort of stall. Uh, they, they, they keep at where they are, but they, they don't really improve. Um, so if, if you would invest in uh, building more advanced CI pipelines or invest in working on continuous deployments or invest in uh, the safety harness with monitoring and, and error budgets, where would you invest on first? Um, I would I wouldn't do an MVC approach and get just enough of those things to start and then build on them. And no, I wouldn't do, the reason in that transition I mentioned, we did the web application is, it was possible that changes to the web app could break the backend data. Like we could record incorrect data, which is, that's a two, it's a one-way door versus a two-way door. That's hard to back out. But it was generally at the end of the process, displaying the data. So we chose the web app because it was lowest risk to break as well, um, or it was the least costly to fix. So think about the risk management as well um, of what happens if something really bad happens here. So like if I was, if I were to be, um, managing the transition, let's say at a bank, where they were doing uh, all manual processes and weren't doing any automated change management. I might start with the mobile app that the bank has, because it's it's important, it's very important. It, it's, uh, and, but you can iterate on it quickly. And I, you know, I wouldn't start with the backend systems that are processing the actual banking transactions. But if you break that, if you people, if if the money, if the number, if the account data is wrong on who has how much money in which accounts, that's a bad thing. And also, uh, so I would start with the lower risk things before moving to the higher risk things. Get wins on the lower risk things first. Not to say that you know the user interfaces that customers use at banks are low are, are, are low importance. They're very high importance, but. Uh, you know, it's it's looking at the various risk levels on those things and choosing with that in perspective as well, in mind as well. Awesome. Yeah. Great. The other thing in terms of this, Sanders, something you and I talked about in the past is you can't do fully automated change management with everything. Um, you can do it on most things, but you know, the you know, if there are human lives at stake, um, if it's healthcare or if it's um so, you know, uh, transportation, you know, uh, where things are moving at high speeds and um, you may not be able to do this if it's a highly regulated industry um, and you, you may not be able to automate as much as you'd like, although automation can really help. So you have to keep those things in mind. The faster you can move on those things on the and have the good guardrails in place, the better. Sometimes you can't move as quickly as you'd like in some of those situations, um, but you can still automate a lot of it as well. Um, so just some things to consider. That and um, on top of that, I think you can still do uh, benefit a lot from continuous change management in terms of um, you, you might need to readdress what production is for you. I mean, production in a highly regulated environment is probably not the end product uh, where the user is using it, but maybe a, a staging environment or a... a um, laboratory environment that you deploy to where you have continuous checks and tests that run so that you can still continuously elaborate and, and change and experiment with new things uh, but you, you then have to follow a certain separate process maybe 
to to finalize and to regulate and to get the audits right and so on before you can uh, push it really to production. On the other hand, if you look at Tesla, uh, Tesla is a highly regulated industry. Uh, they build cars and they are still able to uh, do updates every now and then all over the air to your car. And they are still able to sort of create a better user experience in the car uh, while being highly regulated and while having to, to adhere to these regulations. So I think there is possibility that you have to just think differently into what how these things work. You definitely need a balance. I agree with you there, Sandra. So key takeaways, you know, keeping calm and carrying on, you know, uh, in terms of uh, automated change management is uh, predicting software delivery performance. It can be predictable, so you can improve on it. Shifting security to the left to prevent, detect and prevent vulnerabilities, making things easy, simple, safe, and secure, and having a vision, a plan, communicating it, and also, especially in engineering, it's important to remember to celebrate the wins as well. Anything to add to the key takeaways, Sandra? No, not really. So this is, these are the things that I would like to take you away with you and um, hope you can indeed increase your software delivery performance yourself as well. Great. So thank you very much for, for um, uh, hearing what Sander and I had to say. I'll turn it back over to Chris. Great. Thanks a lot, Wayne and Sander. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Sander and Wayne, for sharing those best practices as well as your own experiences with continuous change management here at GitLab, how our largest customers do this, and also how this was part of your past work. I thought that was really valuable that you all shared those uh, those key findings there. Um, before we jump into some q and I'm going to launch a brief poll. I've just launched that now. Uh, we really appreciate your presence today and would love to know if this webinar was useful for you and your teams. And we want to make sure that we can offer more topics that are relevant to you. So please uh, respond to this poll and let us know how you think, uh, what you thought about it. And uh, Without further ado, let's jump into some questions. So I'm um, looking into some of our submitted questions. And one of the questions was uh, related to the Dora slide that you presented, some of the research there. And uh, what are some of the technical practices uh, that you talked about uh, that help predict better software develop, uh, delivery performance that uh, was mentioned in that Dora slide? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Shall I take this one, uh, Wayne? Yeah. So I I'll give my thoughts and then love to hear your thoughts as well as um, so metric. One is mean time to merge. How long does it take from when a developer is ready, has something changed and is ready to have it reviewed, then merged to when it's actually merged and also mean time to deploy. How long does it take to deploy? Those are two key things. How long it takes from when they're done with the change and ready to have it reviewed and validated before it's pushed to production? How long does it take to actually get to production? I think those are two key metrics. Um, and the other is the um, merge request rate per team, not per person, but the per team, which uh, we watch closely because that uh, merge request rate per person per team, not that all teams are equal and you don't want to look at it on a per person basis. What you want to see is, is that e, is that stable? Is it going up or is it going down and researching why, if it is. Sometimes it's due to unexpected reasons you want to look at. Sometimes it's due to expected reasons. Like you know, it might be a team is working on a bunch of small bug fixes that give you a large number of merge requests. It might be that a team is doing a bunch of spike work and doesn't have that many merge requests because they're doing some investigation. Sometimes it's due to things where somebody's stuck on a team or a whole team is stuck on something and looking at those metrics help you look at, oh, the team wasn't complaining, but they're having they're, they're, they're stuck on something and they could use some help. So it's a combination of those. Those are three of the metrics I look at. So mean time to merge, mean time to deploy, and also the merge request rate per person per team. But again, not looking at a per person level, looking at a per group level, not comparing group to group, but looking at the change in a particular group over time. Cool. Yeah, yeah. these, these metrics would uh, help you in, in, in the lean perspective to discover any non-value adding work, or maybe it's even also in the DevOps handbook. Uh, so you want to discover if there's any non-value adding work happening, for example, interrupt for incidents or so on. Uh, and you want to uh, try to avoid that as, as much as possible. 
um, yeah, technical practices that uh, that, for example, the the door team um, found out and uh, uncovered, uncovered is, for example, test automation, uh, but also deployment automation. Make sure that you automatically be able to to test your your changes and deploy your changes, um, but also a loosely coupled architecture, which is of course not always possible. There are always examples where an architecture is chosen as because it's the best way forward and it's not loosely coupled, uh, but they still uh, found that if you have a loosely coupled architecture, if you can transition towards a loosely coupled architecture, that it will give you a better uh, software delivery performance. Um, now, continuous testing and automated testing helps you in testing a lot more cases than if you would do it manually. And uh, that that's really uh, incredible how that changed. So all the tests you've done before in the past and you, you created in the past can be tested along with any new tests adding and you can test many different scenarios. Uh, that also requires, requires proper test data management. You want to have good test data and you want to also manage that in a version controlled way and make sure that it's automatically available. Um, and as, as Wayne is mentioning, it, the, the error rates or the error budgets are based on monitoring data. Uh, so good comprehensive monitoring and observability really is a difference, uh, making a difference in being uh, good at and predicting software delivery performance. Yeah. Great. What was the second question or the, the next question that came up, Chris? Yeah, that second question, I'm, I'm actually glad that uh, you mentioned error rate, Sander. Um, I think it relates to the second question here. So I think one of the questions was, how, how do the teams monitor the number of errors? And Wayne, maybe you can kind of share what, what GitLab does and Sander, what you've advised customers to do. Uh, on. Uh, so we look at um, two, well, maybe call three primary, well, in terms of error rates, we look at two primary things. We look at for each, endpoint, which might be a portion of the web app, might be the backend uh, GraphQL and REST API um, endpoints as well in the GitLab product. It also could be other things like for Giddily, we, you know, we, we look at error rates and jobs running, et cetera. So we look at how often per thing is it succeeding versus failing. And then we also look at the response time. And we consider over a certain number of uh, seconds uh, failed. And it can be different based on endpoint. Like, you know, a web user interface might have, you have shorter timeframes that you're, uh, that you, you want to make sure users have good experience here. If it's a backend service that users are not directly waiting on, you know, more time may be successful. And look at this and then have, you know, a 99 point, so it depends on the service or the, the part of the web application, you know, 99.5 or 99.9% is our common uh, error budgets. And then once it dips below that, if it spikes below that, we have an escalation where you know, we have automation, we have an SRE team that looks at those uh, in real time and where we work to um, resolve those in real time. If it, if it slowly goes under it or occasionally goes up and back, you know, sometimes it'll waver right off, right on the line. That's where the teams will look at it uh, on a weekly basis to make sure it's not getting away from us. and. Sometimes it takes a while to fix those things. Sometimes they're false positives. It could be that there's an, something is being listed as an error. It really isn't an error. Sometimes because it isn't an error or because there's an automated retry and the retry tends to work and there's not a user waiting on it. Um, so it's okay. Or sometimes that's not the case and it isn't okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. We'll also do something called exceptions where a group for a particular endpoint will get an exception for the error budget. Um, and we, we we look at those pretty intensely to make sure it's appropriate. Sometimes the error rate is low, is high, but it's because something's brand new and getting very little usage. If something gets five hits a day and one out of five is failing, that's a that's eighty percent uh, of that's an eighty percent success rate. But that's really low usage. And if the team knows that they're working on that, like a rearchitecture of that component, or it's not super high priority, we'll give them time to fix that or put in a, a, you know, mark that as not something for the team to look at in an error budget miss versus is. So it's a combination of those things. Related is we also look at um, bug reports from uh, users, whether it's uh, free users, you know, open source users of GitLab, um, whether it's uh, paying customers. And we look at that in terms of the issues filed and also how often those issues 
um, related to support requests from our paying customers um, and also how often we get incoming requests or pings about it from the uh, uh, the sales teams, the customer support teams um, from a paying customer perspective, not from a support ticket, but from other discussions and track those to prioritize the overall the overall priorities as we move it into the um, the backlog for a team, but also look at that in terms of the quality of the component. Um, it's a combination of those things that we look at in terms of error budgets on um, and on bug rates. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Wayne. Anything to add there, Sander? No, this is great. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I, I'm looking here at the Q and A uh, from our attendees here. I think this kind of dovetails with that uh, last response. You know, you know, what's the response time and percentage of fails and success is actually considered a success? So. I think this can highly depend uh, based on you know what we had pr provided in the uh, in the Q and A here, but uh, maybe you can verbalize you know what we do here at GitLab, how we define that, or how we advise our customers to define that themselves, Andrew. Yeah, I, I, it, in terms of um, failed percentage of failed requests, like our goal uh, on most things, if I remember correctly, is ninety nine point five percent success rate. Less than ninety nine point five percent is something to be looked into. And it might change based on the criticality of the service. It can go up or down. Um, and in terms of performance, um, if a web application, I don't actually remember what the actual cutoffs are, but it's something along the lines of, if it's a web application and it takes greater than two seconds to respond, uh, users get very frustrated. So, and we don't look at average because average can average things out too much. We look at, you know, percentiles, like 90, often 95th percentile response time, 99th percentile response time. So your 95th being, uh, uh, well, I don't need to explain what percentiles are, of course. Um, the other is a backend system where there's not a user waiting on it. We may, may not have a two second cutoff uh, on percentile, but it may be higher because, or it could be lower, but it's often higher if there's not a, if it's a something going on in the background where there's not a user waiting on it. You know, generating something that takes 30 seconds, like a big export of data that the user's not directly waiting on um, is, you know, you don't want to put, a, a, you know, web app uh, criteria on something that's back in that a user is not waiting on. We also have real-time systems that are not web apps, but things like, as I mentioned, one of my teams is working on is code suggestions, because that's where as users type AI behind the scenes makes suggestions on the code. Two seconds is way too long for that. That's a real time response time. So something much less than two seconds is really important for that. So it's a combination based on user expectations, looking at these rates, and uh, also uh, especially looking at percentiles on performance and not average or median times. Well, I guess median is percentile of 50%, but something much higher than 50% on, on the percentile. Yeah. There's even sort of an, uh, a standard on, on, on this topic on, on response time, so to say, it's, which is called the APDEX, the Application Performance Index, uh, which gives you sort of a percentage um, between zero and one, but you can, of course, translate it to a percentage on your performance or, or on your response time, so to say. Uh, but you can also define, as you as you say, Wayne, with, with in terms of code suggestions, a two second response time is, is way too long, so you would adjust it. But the the score that you get from that addex score is still the same. So you could use that standard to standardize on okay, what is success, what is a failure, while in the in the back end uh, change what what success means. So to say. Great. Were there any other questions, Chris, from the group? Yeah, we've got a couple more here. Um, yeah, thanks for the response to that. I thought that was great insights and the advice there. Um, we'll pivot a little bit from uh, from metrics to uh, kind of release process. Um, this question's about a canary environment and how does that work? So maybe kind of sharing how we do that here at GitLab and you know maybe how we've advised customers on how that uh, canary environments work. Do we send a percentage of the production load to canary? Uh, a canary environment, which is separate from production, to look for um, an increase in error rates. Um, and if the error rates go up significantly in canary, when we push a new release, uh, we give it pause before we push that release to production because we want to protect our, our production users from it. 
Does it catch everything? No, surely not. Um, but it catches a lot. Um, it catches things that are pervasive across the uh, application based on its usage. It doesn't catch the exception cases. So for example, my team pushed a change that was not caught in Canary or any of the integration tests, it only impacted 0.5% of customers that were using a feature that only 0.5% customer, of customers were using. However, that's a lot of customers and it really broke the functionality for that for those customers. So we didn't catch it in Canary. We didn't catch it in integration testing. We didn't test catch it in unit testing. Um, and when that happened, once so we caught it via customer reports. And what we did is, is we immediately turn that new feature off with a feature flag so that we could get that functionality restored for those customers and then did a RCA a bl or a blameless RCA, blameless root cause analysis. Not only did we fix the problem and rolled out new code that fixed the problem, we looked at how did we not catch this earlier without pointing fingers at people. We looked at how did the process and our systems fail the people in being able to detect this. And it turns out we needed some additional automated test cases that when customer has this feature enabled and this data exists. It was kind of a combination of those. We didn't have an automated test case for that. And we accidentally, developers actually uh, accidentally didn't handle that correctly because they weren't aware of it. And instead of, uh, and then, so we added those automated test cases uh, and then, um, so we could avoid it in the future. If we do create a production um, incident and it, uh, we have a criteria, it's documented in our public handbook. If a team creates a production incident and it's a, of a certain severity, a high severity, we'll also uh, choose if we want to put that team on a, a, a production change lock, a PCL production change lock, which means that that team is not going to push out any new code to production until they get the time to really complete that root cause analysis and take a step back to invest in the time on other things that could prevent future production incidents, which is, it's not punitive. It's to give the team the time to focus on those things. We don't put in production change locks very often. It's pretty rare on a per team basis. And it does feel punitive to that team the first time until they see what it's really about is giving them the time to improve availability and performance. The second time, they don't, it doesn't feel punitive to them um, because we do that blameless root cause analysis and take a step back to go resolve the issues and potential future ones to give them the time to go after that tech debt or other things they really want to work on, um, which helps them succeed and reduce the risk in the future. Key thing on all of that is the blameless RCA. We make it about the processes that people follow and the systems that people use, not about the people that did that may have done the change that caused the issue. It's almost never about the person. It's about the systems and processes supporting the people. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And this this links to uh, the um, culture of psychological psychological safety that Dora mentions again as a predictable factor for um, software delivery performance or organizational performance, as well as to lean where lean says, okay, if something goes wrong, you stop the process and see if you can fix it. So this is this links to both of those, and uh, these are good practices. And thanks. So we're, we're about out of time, Chris. Was was there one last question? Maybe we want to take a shot at. Uh, no, I think I think we're almost at time now, so we'll, we'll wrap it up there. But uh, really appreciate you, Wayne and, and Sandra, for taking the time to walk us through those best practices, sharing your experiences again, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll uh, look forward to sharing the the recording of today's webinar as well as the the deck. And, uh, you know, thank you again for joining us. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, you. Bye-bye.